just uh, while we're doing this series called Follow Me, if you're with us for the first time, uh, we just started a series about what it really means to be Jesus' disciple, a learner, an apprentice of his. And we've been looking just last week and now this second week about what this thing called worship is. And so before the sermon, we're going to hear from different people, testimonies, stories, perhaps highlights of a, a ministry that we're involved in uh, that, that shows that. And this past week, I had the opportunity to sit down with, with Jim Vicklin uh, and hear his story about ultimately how being in the midst of worship uh, brought him closer to God. And my father became an atheist, kind of following, I think, his father's um, learnings. Mm -hmm. and But he didn't want to impose that on, on his two sons. Mm -hmm. And so, as a child, we did go to church occasionally, mm -hmm. to different churches. Um, and I think the, the goal was to uh, give us the opportunity to experience religion or Mm -hmm. uh, church and um, and make our own decision. In high school, I did uh, have uh, my best friend was a, a Christian, um, although I felt uh, tricked at one point by uh, him inviting me to the movies uh, with him and some friends. And uh, as it turned out, it wasn't a blockbuster, but a a movie about um, mm -hmm. a salvation and uh, what happens if you're not saved mm -hmm. and um, so I felt um, a little uncomfortable, especially afterwards with the, with the church, some of the church members asking, you know, so what do you think? You know, mm. um, <laughs> I thought I didn't want to ever go back again. <laughs> huh. yeah. um, my wife uh, grew up in the Catholic church and uh, wasn't uh, a regular church goer as a, as a young adult, and neither was I, of course, um, but her father, uh, got cancer and very quickly uh, mm -hmm. died just um, right around the time when we were getting married. And and his uh, final request really to his family was to get closer to God. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she did. And uh, began a personal relationship with Christ at that, mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And my, within my own household, my really, that first introduction was she would say, uh, nighttime prayers to our new little baby daughter mm -hmm. Elise and um, I wanted to be part of that mm -hmm. and so I would go in and uh, I could hear them praying in the other room but I would go in and and um, it got to be our tradition as a new little family mm -hmm. to, to say our prayers at night together mm -hmm. but I can say this that uh, it was coming here routinely to Fremont where I felt comfortable mm -hmm. where I felt uh, welcomed uh, mm -hmm. as I was, not mm -hmm. not um, not that I had to uh, deceive anybody by claiming Christianity or or mm -hmm. being somewhere that I wasn't um, in my in my walk of faith, and um, and and truly, uh, not until um, I met uh, Brian Doherty, mm -hmm. who was the worship leader at the time. Uh, and I told him my story, and and he um, and that I had been uh, drumming in some other semi-professional bands when I was mm -hmm. younger, and really was moved by um, mm -hmm. by the worship team, and and offered mm -hmm. to uh, participate that in in that any time I could, you know. Mm -hmm. And he brought me in, and um, it has been a terrific journey mm -hmm. being part of the worship team. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it is now, even though when I was younger, I, I appreciated God and nature, backpacking and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. I always felt, um, felt that presence mm -hmm. in nature. Um, but since joining the worship team with, with Brian and now with Jordan, um, I feel the closest, mm -hmm. I really do. When we are worshiping together, um, mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim, for uh, 
to share your story with us. And uh, as someone that also was raised as an atheist, I think I've seen that same movie that you guys know. <laughs> And I wonder if at that time in the church, the church had a little spreadsheet that said, if you encounter an atheist, then go here, show movie, ask this question. But anyway, uh, thank you for sharing. So for those of you that came in after the beginning of the service, you may be wondering what this is doing here. And uh, uh, the scripture today, as I'm about to read, tells us to put God's mercy right in front of us. And so today I wanted to do that. And uh, with the table here too, where we celebrate the fact that Christ has died for us, just a tremendous visual, tangible reminder of God's grace for us. So I want you to hear God's word from Romans chapter 12. This is the apostle Paul writing. And he says this, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, Paul begins this passage with the word therefore. And whenever we run across that word in scripture, it should immediately make us go back and say, what, what's the therefore? What, what was Paul building up to to make him say therefore? And I don't intend for this at all to be an exhaustive outline of the book of Romans, but But perhaps just a a, a brief summary would help us understand how Paul could say, therefore, in view of all that I have just written to you, in view of God's mercy, in all of these ways, we are to offer ourselves daily as a living sacrifice to God. Paul opens the book of Romans by talking that the gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news that God has come to earth and has covered over all of our sin on the cross and that death did not hold him down and but three days later resurrection came and that resurrection is for us as well, that forgiveness on the cross is for us as well. The gospel, Paul says, is the power for salvation. This message is power for our salvation. And that all of us, every single one of us, needs saving. No one is exempt from needing a Savior. He goes on to say that none of us are righteous, meaning none of us have this right relationship, reconciled relationship with God or with others. None of us are righteous. He goes on to to say that this righteousness, though, is available. It's available to us not by obedience merely to a law, but through faith. Through faith. Righteousness, this right relationship, is available to us through faith. And it's through faith and not by something that we have to do first. Because he says that Christ died for us while we were still sinners, while we were still captive to the power of sin, Christ died for us. And so the takeaway from that is that none of us have to clean ourselves up first before Christ comes. But rather, it's in our sin that Christ often meets us at the deepest part. He goes on to say, there's no condemnation then. No condemnation for those of us that receive this gift that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation any longer. And that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 9 through 11, he speaks of... God's people, Israel, that were chosen, chosen to be a light to the nations. And so too, 
we as people that have been grafted into a vine. We too are to be ambassadors, messengers of God's good news to the world. And through all of that, all of that, it's then that Paul says, therefore. Therefore, in, in view of all of that, in view of God's mercy, we are to present ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices. Now, Paul was aware, as one that was raised as an observant Jew, of this sacrificial system where, where something was offering on, offered on behalf of something else. Something was offered on behalf of the sins of God's people. Paul was in view of that. He saw that. But Paul and Jesus both saw the shortcomings of such a system. Or rather, it would be better to say that Paul and Jesus saw our shortcomings of what we do with a system like that. Paul saw, and Jesus says very similar things in the gospel, that it's possible to substitute a ritual for a right relationship. It's possible to substitute routine for something that was designed to bring us into a right relationship with God. It was possible then, and it's possible now, isn't it? It's possible to take something that was designed to bring us life and meaning and purpose and beauty and turn it into a routine and a ritual. I can still remember the very first time that I held my wife's hand and very carefully in a movie, inching my hand closer and closer to hers wondering at the moment that my hand would touch hers and what she would do. And I can remember when our two pinkies touched. And then I reached and she reached. Any of you that have ever experienced that know what that feeling is like, right? It's this beautiful excitement that, that someone has accepted your, your reach of affection. Now, she was in the first service, so she knows I'm saying this. I'll confess to you that when we hold hands now, it's not quite the same. We have to remember almost, in view of everything that we have been through, we have to bring to our mind all that we have been through as a couple, as husband and wife. For that same thing to happen, something that was so beautiful in that first moment could become routine and a ritual. We do the same thing. We do the same thing with, with this. The songs that we sing. Coming to worship. How many of us, even this morning, when well, there's something, going to church, it's possible to take something that can have so much meaning is designed to bring us into that right relationship with God to help us remember all that he has done for us. It's possible to take all of that and turn it into a ritual and routine. Jesus often criticized the Pharisees for taking things that had been handed to them by God's law and turning them into a ritual and missing the bigger picture. He often, one of the things that he told them was that he criticized them for paying attention to, to tithing their herbs, giving a tenth of, of the things that they grew, but neglecting the weightier matters of justice and mercy. The Pharisees had begun to focus on the minutia of God's law, adding to God's law, and they had begun to miss the point. They had turned something into a ritual and missed the beauty of what God had intended. So it's out of that that I think that Paul writes these words that, that he acknowledges that, that our offering of ourselves, our bodies, is a living sacrifice. 
It's a living sacrifice. It's something that, that has to be done on a daily basis. It's not something that can be done once a week or once every several weeks when we feel like it or even as some of the festivals were for, for uh, in Paul's day, once a year. It's not something that can be done sporadically. But that offering of ourselves as a living sacrifice has to be daily. Now he says in these verses that we do have a problem. Every single one of us will have a tendency to want to be molded into the pattern of this world when he says do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The word for world is actually like age or time frame. In Paul's day and in our day, there's a great pull for us to be conformed to the pattern of our time. The pattern of our time that says, this, all of this, this isn't real. It's an old, old story that's been handed down. My dad, who's a Marxist philosopher, told me all the time Karl Marx's favorite phrase, Religion is the opiate, the drug of the masses. We live in a world that says, this isn't real. This isn't necessary. It's not important for you to humble yourself before a God you can't see. That's the pattern of our time. It was in Paul's day. There were people that, that criticized the the Jews and the Christians for worshiping a God that they could not see. Times have not changed in some way, but all of us are being pushed and pulled. How many of us woke up this morning debating whether we should even come? <coughs> List of thoughts came through our head, feelings, excuses. Obviously you made it here somehow. <laughs> but how many of you felt even this morning that there were thoughts that began to bombard your mind and some of them you didn't even want? You didn't want these thoughts and you were battling with yourself going, I'm just about to go to church. Why am I thinking these things? That's why Paul says that, that this transformation of this renewal of our mind is so important. We must have our mind transformed. Thoughts about ourselves and thoughts about God plague each and every one of us. And we need, we need desperately to think differently about who God is and who we are in the light and the view of God's mercy. You ever had that experience? Maybe a counselor or a friend. As you begin to unpack some of the things you think and believe about yourself or you think or believe about God and that person gently corrects you. Gently changes the way that you think and says, no, actually that's not true. What you're thinking about yourself is not true. What you're thinking about God is not true. And if you've ever had that experience, you can feel this tremendous burden be lifted from you. Your mind is being transformed by the truth and grace of our Lord and Savior. And that transformation is so vital, we carry that with us on a daily basis and into a time like this. And it's there that we can offer ourselves that transformation of our mind is in it becomes an offering of ourselves daily. And this, Paul says, is our true and proper act of worship. We'll talk more next week about what it really means to capture these thoughts that plague us. But in the meantime, when you get done watching the Super Bowl, if you open up your Bible today, it might be worth reading 
perhaps even committing to memory, Romans chapter 12. Because we'll revisit it several times over the next several weeks and months in this series. Because within it, it also speaks that to live as a disciple means to offer the gifts that God has given us into the world and to others. It talks about that the people of God are to be generous and hospitable. That's what it means also to be a disciple and a follower. But if you read that chapter today, you may get a clue as to what Paul was thinking about when he was talking about the renewal of our mind. Because this is what he writes. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Beware of pride. Beware of conceit. Perhaps that is one of our biggest barriers to worship. Because to worship something or someone means to bow down and recognize that we are not God. And the pride that all of us have can be misguided. We are Americans. And we are really good at pride. And some of that, some of that, in and of itself is not bad, but when it seeps into our soul, it makes us think that we don't need someone else or something else to help us. We can do it ourselves, including saving ourselves. That's when we begin to recognize that we have misappropriated pride. It's gone too far. And we've missed the need for our Savior. If worship really means to bow down, do you know how hard it is for me to even sit and do this in front of a group of people to physically get down on my knees? How many of us would even be comfortable recognizing that, that there is an authority that's greater than us to bend our knee to someone else. We're not very good at this. That's part of the transformation of our mind is when we recognize we cannot save ourselves. We need the Savior. We must begin to think rightly about ourselves and rightly about who God is. When we begin to do that, we will be able to worship in true, beautiful ways. God tells us that he has loved us with an everlasting love, an undying love. It's out of that that Paul writes these words, for he was someone that I know was confronted by that love. And he wrote, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cannot be separated from his love. May we know that, believe that, understand what good news this is. And may we not take something that's beautiful and just turn it into routine and ritual, but embrace this gift that has been given to us. It's only fitting then that we have this table today to remind us in a very tangible way of God's mercy. The cross and the table in front of us to remind us of how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And no matter how many times you've taken this meal, I pray that this time 
this time would not be a routine or a ritual. That in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, that you would offer yourself today as you taste this bread and drink this cup, that this would be an act of worship. Like it was the very first time you held this bread and you drank this cup.